Hello everyone. Welcome to the Math Hello everyone. Welcome to the much awaited episode of today's digital success dialogue. The topic today, how digitization is driving Indian pharmaceutical sector towards global leadership. With uh, uh, with us our eminent speakers today, Mr. Dara B Patel, Dr. Amit Rajnekar, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Salil S Kalyanpur, Mr. Avishek Rumta and Mr. Dinesh Chinderkar who is also our moderator. This session is in association with Economic Times and is supported by IDM Indian Drug Manufacturers Association. Thank you, speakers. We'll uh, now we'll play a short intro video, and then over to you, Dinesh. Hello, good evening to all of you. Uh, welcome to this session of how digital transformation is driving the Indian pharma towards uh, global leadership. Uh, my name is Dinesh Chindarkar and I'm the co-founder for Media Medic Communications, a pharma and healthcare communication agency. Uh, we are part of this uh, global health PR group uh, and we've been working on integrated communications for the, uh, for the pharmaceutical uh, sector. I would like to quickly introduce the eminent panelists uh, today on, uh, on here. So uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Salil Kalyanpur. Welcome, Salil. Salil is the founder and uh, managing director of Arcs Knowledge Consulting. He's spent around 27 years of commercial leadership uh, across India, emerging markets, and Europe. Uh, I'm sure most of us in the industry know Salil very well for his thought leadership in the industry. Uh, happy to have you on the board, Salil. Uh, also with me is uh, Mr. Dara Patel, uh, another eminent personality representing uh, the IDMA, the Indian Drug Manufacturers Association as the Secretary General. He also coordinates uh, a lot of activities for the for the industry, for the associations like OPPI, IPA, Farmaxel. He's been, for decades, he's been liaisoning with the government and the ministry making representations on various issues for the industry. He's also received the prestigious award of 100 Most Impactful Healthcare Leaders, along with Pharma Ratna Lifetime Award last year. Uh, welcome, sir, uh, to this panel. Uh, also, we have Dr. Amit Rangnekar, uh, uh, eminent personality again from the industry, three decades uh, with Center Pharma, where he heads the supply chain and the digital strategy. He's been very active on the industry side as well, you know, uh, where he works as chairman for the pricing committee of IDMA. He's also a known uh, face in the management uh, field. He's a visiting faculty with SPJN, NMIMS, Somaya, Wellinker, and uh, you know, focusing on marketing, branding, and business strategy. Welcome, sir. Uh, 
also uh, someone who's uh, who sees the industry from the other side an entrepreneur a digital strategy consultant a software architect marketing geek angel investor and a visionary mr abhishek uh, so abhishek is a is a technology guy turned entrepreneur uh, in his teens he's founded int industnet technologies in in the year 1997 Uh, it was a fully bootstrap venture from one person to a family of around 750 plus full time professionals who work from india uk the us singapore and australia so his expertise across technology and marketing gives him the unique ability to synergize the systems with business ensuring a high success rate of innovation and change manage, management initiatives I think it's great to have uh, Abhishek uh, here. Welcome, Abhishek. Uh, Would we'll be happy to, you know, look at some of his distinct uh, perspectives uh, that he brings uh, from other industries and how they would be applicable uh, in, into the pharma. So, setting just the quick context uh, for for everyone here. Uh, I mean, we we've all going through a complete uh, disruption in healthcare. you know right from wearable devices to health apps from integrated healthcare you know to to healthcare at home services we've all been seeing a lot of healthcare start startups booming e pharmacies uh, you know going big time there's been a lot of um, you know recent talks of tata reliance coming in that sector uh, even in the in the you know uh, the, the doctor consulting platforms the 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 whole plethora that's really boomed up the the whole definition of digital health is completely changing and uh, you know in the last uh, year year and a half uh, i think in the new normal we've been seeing a lot of uh, changes that's happening in the pharma industry as well i think we are we are all uh, looking at uh, you know a, a traditional industry suddenly very active on social media now talking about <clears throat> instant gratification a lot of multi channel initiatives uh, virtual board meetings for doctors you know uh, remote detailing and what not i think it's, it's the whole industry is you know been uh, there's a huge shift that has happened you know we're talking about uh, augmented reality virtual reality uh, predictive analytics you name it i think that those are been the buzzword currently within the industry and i think that's where we we're looking at something where we're uh, looking at adoption in the new normal and i'm pretty excited here to host this topic here pretty close to my heart and with all this industry stalwarts being present whom i actually had the opportunity to work learn uh, in, in the in the in the past years so without uh, wasting any further time let me just quickly uh, you know uh, uh, you know pick their brains on 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 the core topic here which is uh, uh, the digital transformation in pharma i think we have seen a lot of acceleration happening in the last uh, uh, 15 months or so i want to really uh, want to get a couple of the mind uh, thoughts from uh, all of you about how do you see the you know, digital transformation continuum and uh, where has been uh, where has it affected the most in the industry uh, can i start with you dara sir on this fortunately the pharma industry which is known as the pharmacy of the world uh, we started this concept almost 5 6 years ago uh, and it's we are not new to it but of course it was not with this type of a gusto that now everybody is looking at it because of this new normal but let me tell you uh, if you see what happened during the pandemic last year the lockdown was declared sometime on the 22nd of march and uh, ever since uh, nobody was allowed to move about no trucks no transport nothing so the pharmaceutical production was hardly uh, the capacity utilization was hardly 25 30% and we worked closely with the government with the uh, police authorities with the distribution people with the transporters and everybody and ultimately in the next two months say by end may it came up to almost 70 to 80% and in the next one month it was almost 100% so we have seen how uh, digitization helps i mean we were all sitting at home or sitting wherever we were and we did uh, function well of course the factory people the people who are on the shop floor they are supposed to attend and they did do a good job so digitization according to us is something is like an idea whose time has come and uh, if you want to survive 
digitization is the uh, in thing with the buzzword today so we don't see this pandemic going uh, totally uh, clearing us uh, at least for another one year so we will have to uh, ensure because uh, if you see the quality control uh, various other issues uh, even the doctor mr uh, interactions everything is now going virtual and we will have to continue with that even exhibitions and all that various meetings everything is on a webinar now so maximum we feel that there might be some relief and there will be some hybrid uh, uh, way of working but digitization is something uh, that is there to stay now and it's certainly going to be helpful right dr amit uh, yeah thank you dinesh on, uh, yeah good evening everybody so i would like to give an international uh, perspective i think uh, dara has covered the indian perspective and i would completely endorse dara's views we have worked hand in hand and you know the kind of uh, escalation and collaboration that has happened at all regulatory government levels has been terrific the challenges have just been colossal but one uh, on a lighter note one follow out of this uh, pandemic which is very positive is that all meetings start on time now there are no excuses these days so if it's 9 o'clock everybody comes at 9 o'clock it starts so that's one positive follow out no traffic <laughs> jam a, yeah uh, so coming back to a digital perspective uh, i am speaking about technology as such i am not speaking specific to pharma but i am speaking specific to healthcare so uh, you know there are four uh, industrial revolutions now the first one was 1760 steam engine then the 1910 revolution which was mass production the henry ford model t then between 1970 and 2005 there was the third revolution which was industrial revolution which was more led by software and automation and now if, since 2011 there has been another kind of revolution which has been coined by the government of germany that is called industry 4.0 so that's the fourth uh, industrial revolution now what does it entail it entails a physical product maybe a service but it also combines all of it with uh, areas like uh, machine learning artificial intelligence internet of things big data and cloud they all come together so probably the next drug will not be invented through clinical trials but it will be invented virtually on a in a lab somewhere which deals in computers so that's the bigger picture i'll illustrate my point with one example uh, in the recent issue of the nature therapeutic psychiatry which is a leading uh, magazine this journal <clears throat> there was a publication by indian students with an indian vigilator a few of them were indian students that's from the university of san diego they thought that the current uh, treatments for depression are not what is expected you know it's a patient goes with symptoms to a doctor a doctor treats the symptoms and you know there's symptomatic relief you are not really curing anything so they thought can these depressive things be predicted can we have a personalized treatment can we identify what are the modifiers of depression so they did a survey using three factors they worked on people who actually had depression and they looked at only three factors the first was the lifestyle devices the people use which are iPhones and Apple smartphones and Apple watches or smart watches so from there they could understand the mood of the person the web applications that person uses the response of the person in the morning in the afternoon in the evening at night then they also looked at what are the uh, factors which are cognitive factors how does he think how does he recognize how what is the knowledge gathering thing so there there are some electrodes planted on the skull so they could actually understand the map and the last was the lifestyle factors in terms of stress levels the sleep the diet and the exercise and they combined all this together and understood that in every individual the predictors of depression are completely different they can easily be predicted and based on that they can be you know cured or treated with a different kind of therapy where medicine is also included but other things are also included so what they try to do is harness things and technology which are already there and based on that come out with a product which is you know very much needed so depression today almost affects 4 and 1/2% of the global population 33 crore pa patients suffer from depression and 200 billion is the cost on that. so this is something which will solve that problem with ubiquitous things like a smartphone using basic technology 
and you know uh, uh, merging it with ai and machine learning and those kind of so i think everybody here would definitely speak about the accelerated learning curve of the pandemic i just thought i'll take a different perspective thank you dinesh that's that's great i think that's a great example uh, you know to look at salil your take you've been uh, past 15 months i've been reading a lot about your blogs and i've, I've followed that but i want really want to uh, you know converge all that in a nutshell what do you feel about for the for the new normal take of the industry i think there has been uh, very two very different or or two very marked changes in the new normal right so one is that uh the concept of time and distance has gone away where uh, we don't worry about we we are working through the day and night without looking at the clock really you know i and uh, i I've, i've seen lots of people talking about it doesn't matter if it's 7 am or 7 pm or 3 pm or 8 pm or whatever you know you just you're in meetings you're doing this and also the time and distance is gone and like i think uh, like amit said there's no traffic jam so you you you're not wasting time in commuting and so on and so forth right so you're getting a lot of productive time which is happening that's that's one part the time and distance piece and the second part i think is that people have got used to a lack of physical proximity however much they hate it but there is a level of convenience right so you don't have to actually go somewhere to consume a service or a product right most of that gets delivered to your home you're able to order it online at any point of time the same thing happens for healthcare right you teleconsulting has picked up digital therapeutics have picked up and uh, so on and so forth so you know where where healthcare used to be uh, i have to go somewhere to get something done i think that that concept has changed a lot and that's from the consumer point of view now from pharma marketing or from the from the service providers point of view i think digital platforms create opportunities for service providers to gather a lot of data what was not available with people or with service providers in the past in an offline world where we knew uh, precious little about customers it used to be hard work to gather that information from customers which is why there were third party market research agencies and this and that now today your digital assets can give you all that information you know enough about not just their their physical and their demographic details but a lot about the behavioral aspects like amit was talking about and those behavioral aspects make a big difference because a lot of digitization or digital effort is all about personalization right now the moment your interaction becomes impersonal there is no obligation for example if a sales rep would go and stand in front in in the doctor's clinic the doctor would kind of you know give him all the signals to say that i am not interested in your call make him wait for hours together and all that but if you persevered if you stood and waited you know things would probably happen there would be some level of uh, Uh, obligation that the that the doctor would feel to meet you in an impersonal world that obligation doesn't happen right so you, there is no obligation at all for the customer to connect with your digital uh, your your email outreach or your webinar invite or your video re- uh, request or whatever you know so from that perspective i think it is uh, lots of people in the industry ask me this question you know how can i get a doctor to open my email how do i make sure that the doctor attends my webinar i don't think you can do that you can't force anybody into doing anything but what you can do is bring in personalization if you are making things relevant or you are reaching out to him with topic him or her with topics of uh, of their interest i think that will you know that that is where the engagement happens so two two three different things one consumer behavior has changed largely because uh, people have been used to an uh, impersonal non proximal uh, kind of connect the second thing is for marketers it means a very different thing because it gives you data and the importance of relevance and personalization and the third very important thing is that there is a dematerialization of services you know what we are seeing today it's it's possible for you to not go to a diagnostic center and still get your vitals checked it's possible for you to sit at home and connect with a doctor it's possible for you to kind of get yourself you know whatever medicines you want delivered from an e pharmacy and and most of all of that right so the convenience part becomes the third part and then that's a, this is making consumers tremendously uh, you know very privileged so to speak because that that puts a lot of uh, pressure back on marketers that if you are not able to give people that experience if you're not able to engage them through personalization and give them that experience of instant gratification you know customers will not engage so that needs us to drive up our uh, our 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 game by a few notches you know and and start to think about how we will behave in a world that has significantly changed as of now we still continue to think that 
the future is an extension of the past. I don't think that is the case. Great. I think, thanks, Adil, for that uh, perspective. Abhishek, coming to you, you know, when you look, you know, at the other industries and you've been servicing them, and uh, you know, you have an outside-in approach towards pharma. How do you, how do you see the adoption uh, with your experience in the past uh, in the new normal? Yeah. So obviously, you know, uh, pharma industry has been, uh, you know, uh, a big user of technology as I have seen recently. But more than that, I would like to bring in a little bit of a fresh perspective about how I look at uh, what is changing in pharma industry from an external perspective, plus what how we should look at from the dimension of how technology change has happened in last few days. Like so, these technology changes will also reflect in can be reflect in the pharma industry in future. So I'll give you one three major areas which you know has evolved in uh, our technology industry in last uh, few years. One is what we call edge computing. So edge computing is something where it is about the decentralization of computing. And I can very clearly relate that pharma industry or healthcare industry is also getting decentralized. You know, you used to have central places like hospitals at one point in time, right? So anything you need to get done, you have to go there and you have to queue up and you have to get it done there. Decentralization means as uh, what, uh, you know, Salil uh, Ji was uh, speaking just now, right? All the, all the activities, majority of the activities happening at your end, right? Be it uh, diagnostics, be it medicine delivery, right? And a lot more will keep happening at your end. In fact, you see that, you know, uh, there are a lot of companies who are also providing ICU at uh, your end, right? So this will continue to evolve. So healthcare is going to get into an edge computing mode eventually because edge computing gives you the benefit because you are not constrained by the infrastructure and you are neither constrained by the capacity limitation in terms of manpower and all and it can it allows you to uh, provide the treatment and provide the uh, capabilities that is required at a given person at a given time right so you can customize things right second thing that we have been seeing in technology industry which i see will reflect into pharmaceutical industry in days to come we use a terminology called microservice architecture now i will not complicate it the very simple model is that there are different components in a software and we try to stack it on top of each other to create a system like a Lego block, right? So there is no one behemoth large system which is working. Earlier, what I understood is like, even if I see 10 years back, 15 years back, the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare industry was working like, you know, in each of their own isolated uh, silos, mm -hmm. big silos, and they are connected using some kind of a linkage somewhere. But I True. see more and more it is going get, becoming like a... Uh, you know, this uh, microservice architecture where everyone is now connecting with each other and they need more and more to connect with each other and to see what new innovative product and offering they can create. Anyone who will not be able to create this new product offering and say, look, I, my business is to sell medicine, I think they will have a difficult time going forward. I think they all need to understand your job is to not just send medicine, your job is to cure people. And to cure people, you need multiple stakeholders and the better you are, you better you are able to adjust yourself or plug yourself into a system which combines all these capabilities together i think the better you will be able to cure people and you will be able to fulfill the objective and as you fulfill the objective right your demand is always uh, soaring and third i would use a terminology from what we uh, what i have learned from uh, start, the startup industry which is burgeoning uh, every day which is we call product based marketing so the future does not hold good for uh, you know, just making me two kind of products, like, right? and then using the power of marketing on television or using the power of marketing in different channels to kind of grow the business. I mean, we have been involved in lots of projects where you have, we have worked with doctor engagement and patient engagement and stuff like that. But I think these engagements will continue to erode in its value for the consumer. The only thing that will increase in value for the consumer is product innovation. So the more product innovation you do, the more you get closer to the problem and the more you solve that problem, you're taking a long tail approach. Because as I said, everybody has the problem is not same for everybody. There is always, always a deviation. And the more accurately your problem statement and your solution fits to the problem statement, the more a person is interested in buying your product. So how you can actually do product based innovation and actually make pharmaceutical industry something which normal people start understanding. Right. Because then only it will have that kind of a usage because now people are intelligent. They will not just say that, OK, I will buy anything that you sell right now. They are, want to know more and more about things. Right. I mean, I think during this whole pandemic, I was just having a, a hearty chat with one of my friend 
एंड ही सेड कि ड्यूरिंग दिस पैंडेमिक वी ऑल हैव अंडरस्टूड व्हाट इज फार्मास्यूटिकल ला राइट सो बिफोर दिस मुझे पता नहीं था तो मैंने बोला मैं आईटी इंडस्ट्री से हूं नो व्हाट आई विल कंट्रीब्यूट टू सच अ एमिनेंट यू नो एमिनेंट पैनल ही सेड नो वी ऑल कैन कंट्रीब्यूट टू फार्मा इंडस्ट्री डिस्कशन बिकॉज़ नाउ वी हैव ऑल बिकम फार्मासिस्ट इन अ वे इन हाउस मैन एंड आई हैव so this is these are some some of my thoughts you know i'm trying to just cross ideas for you yeah no absolutely i think it's it's great to you know get those perspectives because i think there's been some talk around uh, thinking beyond the pill for the pharma and i think that's where i want to you know pose my next question to uh, dara sir that since he represents uh, you know an association uh, uh, for the for the whole industry per se as idma how do you see indian companies opening up you know to, to the to the transformation what's the response there yeah the response is very good in fact as i was telling you idma itself has started now uh, you know going virtual we have all our meetings whether it's the executive committee meeting it's our agm uh, it, it is our special uh, you know certain issue related meeting everything is on uh, webinar now and we've had several training programs for our members with various experts on uh, digitalization and what do you do so we are trying to uh, rise to the occasion see that our members understand that either you uh, go digital way or uh, you will have to uh, diminish your business so if you want to grow then you have to go by uh, di- digitization and even now we know that in marketing the doctors and the mrs everybody it's all on, on uh, virtual very few doctors are encouraging uh, patients to come and meet them or even the uh, mrs practically everybody is on this so people have realized now that yes we have to go but you have to systematically uh, hold their hand and see that they follow these uh, procedures they understand what is to be done it's not just the pharma industry alone everybody will have to fall in line like uh, amit will agree that the distributors and uh, the everybody the mrs everybody will have to now become uh, tech savvy and uh, understand what is in it for us otherwise it's going to be difficult and i'm glad abhishek said that people have understood the pharma industry better yeah. uh, earlier a lot of people criticizing us uh, now he will know what pharma is doing and how we are benefiting the the nation and the uh, and the whole world so it's it's a music to our ears now you know what he said yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. absolutely in fact i i, I know of a you know, couple of uh, strong sessions that idma did over the past 6 months especially yeah. to help the whole industry to take them to the next level so it's great to know that so let's let's understand from dr amit from as he represents uh, center of pharma how how as an organization have you evolved uh, in the new normal sir so again uh, dinesh uh, what dara said or what salil said earlier i think answers that question from a perspective in terms of uh, how digitization or how rather the pandemic affected and how we react again i would rather take one example again from our uh, company which we had uh, so i'll just uh, speak about a product launch kind of thing which would give you a perspective of how different it was this time than it has been earlier so we have all grown through personal selling it has been the physical uh, meeting with the doctors which have built our company and suddenly that learning curve was accelerated maybe by some people say as much as 5 years in a year so whatever it may be Uh, so we were fortunate we are among the first companies among the first few companies in india who have actually launched a new chemical entity we have researched a drug developed a drug and launched a drug for the first time in the world in india correct and we were fortunate that we could launch it during the pandemic bang in the pandemic so there was no physical meeting with the doctors <clears throat> there was no physical meeting with the retailers hospitals patients yeah. we there was no way we could meet anybody but still we went ahead with the decision so obviously all the cmes the training everything went uh, digital which was a sharpened learning curve for us everything went digital even at the city level we had cmes with doctors so to sensitize them to what the product was tell them about the benefits of the product and this product is for diabetic foot ulcer so diabetic foot ulcer is an unmet need there is no cure for it and unfortunately it results in amputations so with our drug which is 86% or 90% success rate we can actually sell save precious limbs so that's the kind of you know uh, thing which we were fortunate to launch we now thought that once the launch takes place how do we how do we sensitize the customer so we created qr codes on the packing itself 
we can yet get a qr code because now i think even the smartphone curve is accelerated so all people had to do was scan it with the camera and you had everything about the product right on your camera so since we are a pan indian company we had uh, qr codes uh, videos in 13 languages 13 national languages we had videos made we directly took the patient to the website and explained in his language of choice so he could understand and it's a reconstituted so you have to mix two bottles and we gave a micro tape free we gave a bandage free we gave a gauze free we gave everything for seven days treatment free in that box because we didn't want the patient again to go to the retailer or the doctor it was not possible so we actually took advantage of this we created a box where a full week treatment was given to a patient there was a qr code on top of that he could scan and actually understand how to reconstitute the drug how to apply the bandage how to change it daily because it has to be administered daily so how to do it so that thing was accelerated completely digital then we went to the next level we have a phone number we have a sort of a call center in house call center where pay, anybody can call us about stocks about any queries about the product and now we are going to the next level where we are looking at wound management digitally now that is something on the anvil where you know the bandage needs to be changed daily so can we provide that service to the patient we will not be incurring that cost but we can give the details in that local area to the patient and that could be the next level of service being an nce which is a privilege to launch so we thought that we own that customer experience right from the prescription to the solution so that's how we looked at thank you very good that's that's we to know them so in how how do you see the you know the disruption that's happening in healthcare delivery uh, what's your thoughts on the on, on, on the on this Salil, you're you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just realized that. So uh, I, I'll just extend uh, what I was talking about. You know, I think it's an extension of the behavior shift that has happened in consumers and uh, and and the way that uh, service providers have reacted to that behavior shift. You know, so that's why we are seeing a lot of these ecosystems, these digital ecosystems getting created, the the apps, the super apps getting created. The like you talked about the Tata, the Geo, the you know the uh, maybe the uh amazon will come in at some point maybe walmart maybe all these guys you know farming is doing a lot of different things so the reason for that is that uh people i mean uh, after when the digital transformation has happened or, the, or or this covid actually disrupted this whole healthcare delivery it became about how do i get stuff to the consumer rather than hope for the consumer to come to me right and and i was able to get uh, a lot of services from a diagnostic center which which was inside a hospital that hospital also had a pharmacy the hospital also had doctors earlier that used to be the sort of ecosystem that was created which is a physical ecosystem now i am trying to create all of that online and i am trying to get your so home uh, healthcare at home has become a very very important part right and and i think uh, what uh, abhishek said uh, like uh, mr patel said is music to my ears but a little different point right so he said that pharma has to imagine or realize that you know it has to go beyond the pill it has to not the the role of pharma is not just to make a medicine but it is to cure people or at least to help people stay healthy extend life you know so i think that's an important point because if uh, you know i read uh, mr velumani's interview today he was asked about the his merger with pharmacy and why he sold his stake and all that and he used a very interesting phrase to describe uh, the different healthcare providers he said pharma companies will be like the kitchen and pharmacy like companies will be the zomatos you know so pharma that means you know pharma is kind of getting relegated to manufacturing and distribution alone while all the front end patient facing work is going to be happening by digital health companies now this is this is a lack of space you know you're giving away territory if we are allowing uh, other companies to come in and become the zomatos you know then we should be a little wary about where that patient engagement is going where that customer engagement is going and how we want to kind of build on uh, additionally because one is to manufacture and distribute medicines but a much larger market is about how i can serve people to be to be fit and and think about collaborations think about platform based the company structures and and all those kind of things so i think the most important change in which healthcare delivery has been disrupted is the realization that you need to scale up operations pharma has for 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 a long time defined its customers as only doctors and you know we get at best about 40% or 50% of the entire doctor coverage in the in the country 
when you're using so earlier the trade off was do i need to double my field force if i have to increase my coverage which is not an economically viable solution today i have digital where the marginal cost of serving the next customer is is low right okay. if i have a platform which means to say that if i have a platform and i can serve 2 lakh customers very very comfortably it doesn't take too much to take that to 20 lakhs or it doesn't take too much to go to 2 crores right so if you see companies like farmeasy they they are they have got 12 million customers okay uh, 1mg had 20 million customers curefit has some 30 million 10 million customers 100 they were looking at going to 100 million customers soon so the ability to scale and the ability to serve i think these are two important concepts of digital marketing right the whole concept is how do i how do i serve my customers which is basic marketing and how do i use technology to serve at scale that's that's i think uh, the the greatest impact on healthcare should come there it hasn't it hasn't come in pharma there are other companies which are stepping in and doing this the quicker pharma realizes that we need to either collaborate or or get on to or compete i think uh, you know the better for us great i think thanks salil for that and just uh, taking that question and bouncing it off to abhishek here that what do you see because you've been you know so focused working on insurance banking you you've seen the other sectors and trying to look at uh, you know what opportunities how do you see what are those opportunities in pharma and how how what kind of uh, new technologies do pharma needs to adopt so i think pharma is going to go through massive disruption and it is already visible so i am already seeing pharmaceutical companies coming up with uh, you know insurance products uh there are startups which are coming up with subscription products tying up with pharma companies and insurance companies so all these things are getting intermingled and i was uh, long time back when i was looking at all these distinct industries it was very clear to me that these industries all have to come into an interplay eventually and they will all have to work with each other in some or other way i mean we cannot consider insurance separate from pharma i mean even 10 years back if someone would have said insurance and pharma what what do they have in common people would not have thought about it but now everybody knows that yes <clears throat> you know any kind of a opd insurance needs a pharmaceutical tie up and pharmaceutical companies can actually get into that kind of a segment and can build a big business out there right so that is one area as i said earlier that you know we cannot work in isolation anymore and therefore the integrations and new product creation now that is only left to our imagination so when new companies are going to create new products right uh, as as it was rightly pointed out by uh, salil ji right they can explode exponentially like see the case of pharmacy and other players right who have stayed just into the physical world right they have struggled the the physical companies have struggled and pharmacies and the other companies who have been digital they have actually have come over and actually control the consumer experience and controlling the consumer experience will become very very critical which a lot of pharmaceutical companies have been very hesitant in doing they said that you know ki we are just basically manufacturer and supplier to the supply chain after that you know it's a uh consumers business is handled by the retail operators and the dealers and the distributors i think that concept has to change uh second i think there are things which have not yet reached indian shores but it will very soon be here uh like uh, health records on blockchain uh you know uh, pilferage management using blockchain i think these are two major changes that will happen because uh we are very well aware of the you know of of uh, uh, the challenges that we found when the uh, you know fake Uh, vaccines were used in kolkata some time back you must have heard the news fake vaccines were used on hundreds of people in kolkata right so i mean people would like to have more control over their lives i think still they are a little hesitant but 5 years down the line you will see people are not hesitant at all they will ask questions and i think pharma companies or other healthcare companies have to be very well prepared to be able to answer questions to all these consumers so so the better you prepare now you will be in a, in a good situation when these people start asking you difficult questions and you if you are and if you are the one who are answering it first i think you will have that competitive advantage and that mind share of people as they will automatically qual- qualify you as a uh, as a company with good heart right i think now people start looking at companies with good heart right i mean it is not enough that they are providing good co- content and good quality product they want that the company has got a heart as well right so i think all these things will fall in place uh genetics and genomics related as i said hyper personalized medicine will be very very key uh i am when i am already looking at the us ecosystem in terms of startups there is a massive inroad of biotech startups there is so much of work being done purely by absolute com- you know uh, people who are into research they are bringing new drug discovery they are doing new uh, diagnostic products and it's like exploding like crazy 
and they are literally challenging the uh, you know the established players in the us now what is happening in the us in startup ecosystem will also come to india it's just a matter of time it may happen in 2 years it may happen in 3 years at most it will happen in 5 years right so how will pharmaceutical companies collaborate with these companies rather than compete with that will also be a thing that you need to think about i mean the way banks have been challenged by in the fintech the pharmaceutical companies will also be challenged by these biotech companies who are going to come to indian shores very soon so these are just some of my thoughts based on uh, what i am able to connect between technology startup and pharmaceutical industry yeah abhishek sure i think that, that really helps uh, you know to to yeah. look at it from a different perspective altogether great thoughts on that and i mean coming back to dara sir i mean uh, you know we've been talking at india has been the under the pharmacy for the world and that's been a buzz around that so do you see uh, you know moving forward in the next 5 years 10 years how 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 can the digital transformation help us uh, get better mind share there in that space see uh, quality is the main concern today when when you talk about a pharma industry everybody patient centric and quality and today even virtually a lot of quality inspections are taking place and idma itself is now professing it we have been telling our regulator if you see the example of mhr and other regulatory bodies they are complete they are doing hundreds of inspections virtually and there are so many good systems we have you know like this google glass and such devices you can see everything very clearly you don't need a physical inspection of course in certain cases you might need at a later stage but otherwise for small small things you don't need to fly down and that is what is happening today and we can assure quality by digitization only thing is there should be a proper integration and uh, coordination between the it personnel and your technically qualified uh, pharma people if that is done then virtual inspections uh, are the order of the day now so idma is trying to uh, impress on our regulator also that it's high time you do the virtual inspections because that's going to be the the future now yes and people are doing it and they are succeeding you know, all applications we are making virtually the government departments also are giving a regulator also giving us uh, approvals on email uh, nobody comes to inspect your factory so all this this is going to uh, contribute uh, towards uh, pharma developing that image that if the west can do uh, why can't we do it and our regulator has to take that bold step and we are working with them we are working great that's great i can see a lot of questions popping up from uh, you know multiple people let me just quickly uh, you know uh, take a uh, couple of them uh, uh, dr amit uh, you know uh, there have been some questions on marketing here so you you as center you have a lot of brands which are category leaders in their space so how from a marketing standpoint do you think that digital will drive the brand leadership to the next level yeah so uh, we are brand leaders with sinarest sinarest is the largest prescribed indian anti cold brand we are leaders for 25 years and uh, the volumes are such that it's two prescriptions every second by doctors in it that's the kind of volumes we have now uh, speaking of the digital perspective now this is a brand again which is built by face to face uh, marketing it is completely yeah. physically built but last 15 months our teams have done exceedingly well the marketing teams the sales teams we have in evolved new digital initiatives and we have been able to consolidate and maybe increase our market share so one out of every two prescriptions still are sinarest in the cold space now looking at it digitally how do we take it forward uh, i would just give you an incidence taking something from salil as well as taking something from abhishek you know 3 years back we met a doctor who asked us uh, uh, if do you know the journey of an indian patient so we said uh, yeah so he said if an indian patient has a legal problem who does he go to so we said a lawyer he said correct and if that indian patient has a uh, problem with his car whom does he go to so we said he goes to a car mechanic he said correct and if he has a medical problem whom does he go to so we said doctor he said wrong he first goes to the internet he will go to the internet go on the social media find out everything do some miracle cures kadas something will happen then go again on the social media read seriously self medicate and then go to the doctor that's the journey so doctors told us do something for this do something for self medication do something to avoid self medication sensitize people and he said maximum self medication happens in the areas of cold and cough so as leaders you should take the onus so two years back we designed a facebook page called as nozipedia nozipedia 
okay and uh, we you know gave content which was good we asked doctors what content should be given we gave content which was specific sensitive you know to sensitize people to the perils of self medication and you will be surprised that within 3 months we had 97000 followers 97000 followers and 99000 likes amazing just taking off and most of them were doctors and doctors were so happy with this effort that we are making you know sincere effort maybe virtually to sensitize reach on a very mass scale so that was one second uh, do i have 30 seconds more to answer yes do i have the time yeah so quickly now we are developing something which would be for the first time in the world for sinaris to carry it forward so we are, it would be launched on 1st of uh, july so i won't be disclosing the details but it would be a game changer for sinaris which would digitize the prevalence of cold cough fever all across state wise on a digital form so the launch is on 1st of july this would be a real game changer in terms of brand engagement great we look forward to it yes, just yes. a couple of days to go so pretty excited about going back uh, salil there's there's been a lot of questions on the uh, you know as you can see in the uh, chat there a lot from a marketing perspective so uh, let me just summarize them maybe a couple of them into i think more of more or less there's there been i can see marketers asking to uh, uh check from you your perspective on the opportunities that pharma has in terms of giving better health outcomes uh with digital transformation what's your take on that so i think uh, that's a great question and thank you for uh, summarizing most of uh, i think there are about four or five i think you summarize them into mm-hmm. one very nicely so i think health outcomes is is an important part of pharma more so since value based pricing and all of these kind of things have come up in in the west right you have to show that your product works and 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 the product works not just uh, in terms of uh, toxicology and safety data but in the real world so i think there's a there's a combination of the real world evidence there's a greater acceptance of real world evidence today from regulators because if you see the speed with which vaccines came into the market and uh a lot of other uh, covid related products are coming in with emergency use authorization and all that there's there's a, a, a definite level of uh, pragmatism that regulators are also showing right so they are not uh sticking to the old dogma but they are allowing uh, all these things to happen so accepting that kind of information accepting those kind of uh, data points are important and therefore you know pharma has the most to gain by by engaging into this or developing real world evidence capability and this is real world evidence is probably one of the best ways in which you can actually map health outcomes now right? because you are you you are watching how a medicine acts in the human body in a real world not in a clinical setting right? and there's a difference between the two and that sort of evidence is is important that sort of data points those collections are very important and those are now getting legalized also in the sense that formal uh, submissions of rwe are are in, are working with regulators as well i think one of the things that we need to understand about uh, about how data is is working with patients or how patients are responding to the digital world is that the four p's of of healthcare marketing are very different from what philip kotler talked about right so the four p's of marketing is the data because of the amount of data that is available today self diagnosis possible right you have a watch on your hand you know what is your spo2 what's your glucose level what's your oxygen level and etc etc that's kind of making uh uh your your healthcare very predictive you know whether you are in at a level of fitness whether you have a level of uh, wellness or or there's something problem with you, you know now the new i uh, i watch is actually going to be able to map glucose blood glucose levels right when you just wear that watch on your hand without any invasive techniques so i think those are kind of miraculous for uh, people with diabetes and things like that so if you know that there is a predictability to your healthcare once there is a predictability to your healthcare it makes you participate in your own healthcare decisions right and so that's the second p when people know what is happening to them they participate they know that this is these are the foods that i should eat these are the foods that i should stay away from i should, i need to do this much of exercise i need to burn so much of calories you're measuring every part of all of that through variables and sensors right and that is also then creating a very personalized data plan or a health plan they become it, it becomes very personalized and and the focus entirely is shifting towards preventive or management right if you don't have a cure you are either managing or you are preventing and i think prevention or or wellness so therefore it opens up another world for pharma which is the wellness industry so i think a little bit of shifting from 
uh, defining ourselves as patient centric to human centric or people centric you know you are then thinking about the human person as a whole right. giving that person a sense of wellness also and wellness is not just the absence of disease right wellness is real wellness the presence of wellness making sure that they, he's fit and therefore by through participation through personalized health plans all of these so these are all health outcomes right these are all outcomes of living well and if you are able to live well and if you are able to people are able to see that they are able to live well that they're living a wealthy, very healthy life and pharma is doing something as a service to help them out or any other part of the healthcare industry is doing something to help them out they well they treasure this so i think you know uh, it's been i've been cajoling the industry to think a little beyond simply selling medicines and trying to think about you know and that's why what abhishek said made lots of sense to me you know it's it's not just about selling medicines but it's about curing people or or making life worth living you know and so there i think the outcomes part is a very very important role to play so there should be a lot of focus on on managing patient uh, not just patient outcomes but health outcomes and allowing people to then uh, decide how to how to manage the whole thing great i think that's that summarizes quite well um, and just taking that aspect of you know the whole focus on patient and you know, like you said it's more about human centric uh, you know approach that needs to take so there's there's been a rise in digital therapeutics as a, as a category where we're talking about patient engagement personalization uh, specific protocol so from a tech perspective abhishek i would like to uh, see how how do you see digital therapeutics as a as a sector within the industry and how uh, you know how how pharma can adapt to it See, I think digital is an enabler and a connector, right? So digital doesn't itself solve all the problem, right? But obviously, it can keep sensing and measuring. So obviously, you now we have the sensors almost at the edge, right? So what is happening with the patient is known at all point of time, right? Uh, uh, the data is going to another uh, player in the industry, which can be the healthcare company, right? Uh, immediately, we know exactly what needs to be done. The, and the third player, of course, then again comes the pharmaceutical company. They tell exactly what medicine has to be administered. Now, what I'm saying is that as a, as a business, uh, it makes a lot of sense for pharmaceutical industry to own up this whole ecosystem or own a majority of this ecosystem and the consumer experience, though they might actually be making money or generating revenue from one portion of it. But to own the consumer experience and the consumer uh, relationship, you need to be there in a bigger way and and the consumers whole experience again is uh, you know connected with the sensors the analytics which basically makes it simpler for doctors and health workers to take decisions on them right uh, so these are will be very important factors and how all these factors are integrated so i think integration is very under uh, discussed i mean we don't discuss it too much that you know how these whole all these different entities will integrate because this is not very common in this industry in India and globally. In fact, we have all worked in silos, right? We have all created our own industries uh, and uh, sub industries within. Them. So until and unless they start working together, I, I see that this whole experience that we want to actually create using digital, uh, it will happen, but it will happen very slowly or it will not be up to the mark, up, uh, up to that level that we want it to be. If I can butt in, most of our most of the big pharma or maybe the mid size have already started doing this. If you see companies who are into managing hypertension or uh, diabetes or other lifestyle drugs, asthma, they are trying to inform the public, inform the patients how you should manage your lifestyle, how you can keep your uh, blood pressure under control, how to avoid diabetes, how to take yeah. care of your lungs. So they've, they've started doing it. I think we are becoming, we are, as Salil said, we are not just patient centric, but we are now becoming human centric. Of course, we have a long way to go, but uh, people should be aware that we are working in that direction. So I have also seen some pharmaceutical companies also becoming device companies uh, and they bring out with devices, especially for managing lifestyle diseases. So you can continuously test, continuously understand what's going inside your body. And then either you take some very basic, uh, you know, lifestyle changes or then you either you take medicine. It depends, right? So a lot of times, you know, if your sugar level is a little high, you did not take a medicine. You can, uh, if you are at borderline, you might be able to treat yourself with some basic uh, lifestyle changes. If you are continuously on a higher side, you may need to take medicines, right? So that uh, genuine information also need to be shared. And that ex that experience with that kind of a device also has to come. So I think pharmaceutical companies also have a huge opportunity to get into the devices area which is going to be uh, pretty important in days to come. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, viewers have been sending a lot of questions. So 
probably I'll skip a few of my questions and let's take what, what people are asking. I think that's the best way to do it. So one question here is uh, from Mr. Sanjay Nirwan. He says uh, that should one rely on traditional research methods or digital mapping of search behavior and social listening for planning your campaigns? And what role should marketing transform in the new era from traditional marketing practices? Uh, so anyone wants to take uh, a quick uh, jab at that? So I think uh, let, let me take a jab at that and maybe I can pass on to Amit uh, for <laughs> final comments. So I, I think uh, digital marketing or marketing per se is, is about understanding customers, right? You're never able to do uh, a well formed out marketing campaign unless you know what your customers want. Now, unfortunately, we've somewhere straight down the line into product becoming very product centric and we are we're doing a lot of you know product selling and brand selling rather than actually reaching out to customers with stuff that they want on digital there is a need for uh, for that not to happen right so in the traditional way in the in the offline world traditional market research and all of that was very important because it used to give uh, a, a lot of insight into into what was happening in the uh, in, in the market, right? What customers were thinking about, what they were doing, but we wouldn't really have seen a lot of importance on psychometric or behavioral data. We would probably be seeing a lot of market trends and all of that. And sometimes what happens is we're looking for data to, we have that confirmation bias, right? We we look for data to uh, to inform our our thoughts, our biases, you know, this is the way that I've, I know the doctors will work and I look for that particular piece of information to confirm. Now, in the digital world, there is a lot more that you can get than you can get from your traditional market research, right? You're able to get a lot of that behavioral part. So the demographic data, while traditional marketing can give you all that information, the behavioral part, what's the customer thinking? What's he doing? Because a lot of us, when we are online, we cannot behave, we cannot put on a facade because at some point of time you become, you know, you, you do unconsciously what you're doing. So our likes and dislikes, our preferences, our content, what websites we want, who influences us, where do we want to see our uh, our information, you know, all of those things become very interesting data points for, for marketers to gather. And if we are able to gather, I think that's that's why the reason of, uh, you know, now privacy becomes a, becoming such an important tool because, uh, you know, marketers have too much information from all the data that is gleaned from by the Amazons, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. Right, so there is that level of uh, data insight or uh, that level of detail that you can get in in uh, through digital mapping. So I think social listening, digital mapping are very very important tools that need to be added into the traditional market research armamentarium. You don't let go of physical, but then you you behave because this is like twenty four seven. It's it's constantly evolving. You know, a traditional marketing market research you would probably do once in a year, max once in a quarter or or twice a year or something of that sort. Right, but this is something that's going on all the time as people visit your uh, your di digital assets you're collecting data constantly and in, and that's real world right it's happening in real time so that's like invaluable for a marketer absolutely so i think just a, a follow uh, dr amit you want to comment anything on that anything yeah, just this? one line i think uh, uh, salil has covered everything just uh, today the challenge is actually data explosion i think you have to yeah. discern what is really important have a segmented genre of customers understand them and digital actually gives you that opportunity to do so you can really understand who are your customers pinpoint target your strategies towards them there are different genres which you need to understand behavioral genres which you can understand psychographics psychoanalytics demographics all that play a big role in this but behavior is very important that can be mapped and strategies can be tailor made to those but i think content is king you have to also understand yeah. that you know, the customer is flooded with data. You are also flooded with data. So you have to respect his time, try to understand him at the time he wants, give him the content he wants, and try to get the information. That would be a better approach than a one-size-fits-all fit, uh, approach, which was the earlier uh, case. Absolutely. I think one of, one of the key qu uh, follow-up questions for one Mr. Dillon is, uh, what which slice of marketing pie will grow and shrink with digital engagement? Any anyone wants to uh, comment on that? Amit, you want to take this? Yeah, actually, I have not understood the question, frankly. Uh, what does he mean by Mr. Dylan? If you could just put in quickly, what do you mean exactly yeah. by which slice of the marketing pie will grow and shrink? I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Okay. 
Yeah, okay, probably. So let, let's wait for the, the question to come in. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions is also about the, the medical rep and doctor communication. They say that uh, the communication is improved in digital, but it's largely restricted through WhatsApp and some closed medias. And the conversion response rate is less. So what will be the way forward for, for the doctor connect here? That's something which that's question for the largely for the industry and anyone wants to please go ahead. I think ultimately a hybrid system will only work. You can't go on uh, digitally having this interaction. So you will have to go to the bridge and then see how it is working. I am sure yeah. Salil will uh, be able to throw a little better light on it. But uh, you can't be complacent saying, okay, now because of this pandemic, I continue with the digital way of meeting the doctors. So ultimately, you might have to you say if you are having eight visits in a month or whatever, and you restrict it to maybe two or three, and the rest of the time you do it uh, virtually. You have to find a proper balance. Yeah, I think in the last uh, fifteen months or so, I think digital has been a word which has been, you know, doing the rounds, uh, Salil, <laughs> and it's vastly abused as well. Uh, maybe a quick take from you on that. Yeah, I think look, uh, the the communication and engagement, right, is is always about uh, our relevance. Right. And uh, like Amit said, content is king and content can only be king when it is relevant to the customer. So if we if we approach the customer from our point of view, saying that, you know, I have done a webinar and I am doing a webinar on this topic and I want you to come, the customer has no obligation to do that. Right. So there will not be I, if you think that WhatsApp and webinars are the only connect that you have with customers, that's not right. Right. There's a lot of other options that can be tried out and all that. But why are, I think it's important to also take a step back and say, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for brand conversion? Am I doing this for uh, to get numbers onto the webinar? I don't think that's right, right? That's not the right measure to, to look at it. There is a particular reason why you're reaching out to the doctor. And it may be a reason that he is either not aware of your brand or, the, or, or he thinks about a comp competing molecule or another brand as more important than your brand. Or there has to be something that you want to communicate at that point of time, right? You need to move him across the adoption funnel. If he's unaware, you move him from unaware to aware, from awareness to trialist to loyalist, whatever. You know, you're kind of moving him across the IDA pathway. So I think the objective of reaching out to the customers has to be very, very clear. And if you don't have that objective in mind and you do a shoot, a spray and pray, you know, then hope is your only strategy. Right. And, and we all know hope is not a strategy. Right. So you cannot do that. You cannot spray and pray and then hope that people will come to your meeting. You have to be very clear what you want to do in that webinar. There's a particular part of my brand that is not worth. I mean, there's a scientific concept that my customers haven't understood really well. So maybe I want to get that. Right. So then I have to do a targeted. Uh, so I can't do 7500 people coming on my webinar. And then I say that that's a great one. Right. If there is if there is a marketing manager or, or that person's boss who thinks that numbers are more important than anything else, then he is measuring the wrong thing. Right. So the objective of that activity has to be important. The objective then becomes very targeted. And when you target it, your relevance becomes important. And that's when engagement will happen. Right. If I'm if I'm getting if I receive a webinar which is going to clear a doubt of mine, I will attend it. Or if there's something that will add value to me, I will attend it. I will make the time for it. So maybe not all the time, but as I get better and better at it, I think that's what's that's where the engagement happens. So I think it's the idea should not be about how may how can I convert more, but the idea should be is that how do I sharpen my objective? How do I know why I am doing this activity? And once I know that, I think I can I will be successful in what I'm doing. Can I just take ten seconds, please? Please go ahead. Dinesh, just yes, to add to Salil, I think Salil has covered. Only one thing is you have to also show the customer what role he's playing. Give him that importance of the role he's playing in the entire thing and how it serves him. That's that's the more important part. If you can deliver that kind of thing, then I'm, I think everybody would be on board with you. But if you bombard them with what you want, then it's not going to happen. You have to understand their mind, their behavioral patterns, the psychographics, and then tailor make it to them. Otherwise, it's not going to work because it's an explosion for everybody, for us also and for the customer also. There's no obligation for it. Correct. Uh, I think we have, we have short, overshot our time, but maybe we can can we continue for another five ten minutes so that we can maybe take a couple of two questions. Okay. Great. So, uh, uh, Abhishek, I, I had always been curious about you know uh, the adoption, the shifts that I've seen in the other industries, right? So, 
is is there one key learning that pharma can really take and with something they can execute immediately right now that you see a need and an unmet need that can be uh, you know uh, taken up quickly i think uh, one thing that i would definitely suggest is keep an eye open to see what the startups are doing uh, new new uh, products are being created by startups all over the world and biotech is not lagging behind it is almost coming neck to neck with fintech and insurtech so uh, look at that as a critical element and not ignore that that you know you cannot do r&d as a startup you know you need huge cost there is a huge cost outlay there is a you need a lab and you need this permission and that permission i think the world is adapting to their way of working rather than the other way around right so i think we need to uh, keep our eyes open for them and embrace them wherever we can uh, you know either partner with them or see what should be our strategy to compete with them they have disrupted all other industries and obviously they will also come for this industry they have already come so there are there is businesses working in similar areas right and uh, so this industry also need to uh, prepare itself ahead of time uh, before it comes and disrupts parts of it. Yeah, very much, you are on mute we can't hear you Dinesh, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, this this another question here. Uh, uh, one second. Yeah. So, Salil, uh, around patient centricity, I think that's one of the questions that a couple of questions around that, and the opportunities for pharma in the new normal. Any top level thoughts on that? Salil, you're on mute. Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> sorry about that. So I think we covered that in uh, a little bit, right? Yeah. So we spoke about how patient centricity is moving towards human centricity. Yeah. And when you say patient, you are kind of, you know, looking at it very myopically because you're only focusing on the sick, right? And and when you start to say people or you start to say human centricity, then you're then in the, the, the whole market kind of broadens. So I think it's, it's important to understand or redefine our customers. I think that's one of the biggest uh, learnings or lessons that uh, pharma should take from this pandemic. Who is who is our customer? Is our customer only the person who takes our medicine, or is a person who has the possibility of of doing anything in the sense that you know he wants to stay well, he wants to be doesn't want to go to the doctor, doesn't want to go anywhere. So you know who who is our customer? Is it just the the doctor? Does it also include the the patient's caregivers, family, insurance companies, hospital administrators? e-pharmacies, the whole kind of ecosystem, you know, that itself can expand this whole thing. And then if I take the illness and the wellness together, then there's a whole host of different uh, 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 approaches that can be taken. So the cure fit model, you know, is, is a wonderful way in which they manage 360 degrees, right? So they would recruit a patient uh, or, or a person who is a 15, 16, 17 year old person out of college, out of school, just going to college, fitness becomes a big thing. They go to gyms, you know, then when, when you go to gyms, then you want good food or healthy food and then you want uh, meditation and mental stability then you want you want uh, insurance then you want primary care then you want uh, attire you want so many different things so different businesses begin to open up different patient acquisition routes oh, not patient sorry customer acquisition routes open up and so on and so forth so i think the patient centricity part is one about how i can get uh, uh people who are on my medicines how can i demonstrate greater outcomes or or great health outcomes to them for people who are just about to come in, what sort of services can I have? For people who are nowhere, anywhere close to having a disease, can I do something for them also, right? So I can expand my market to, to create a whole host of uh, services and all that, and all monetizable, right? You can create revenue streams out of these. And, and so therefore, I think we shouldn't be slave to our whole concept of I can only make medicines and I will not do anything else. And if we can take a step back and redefine, you know, we go back to Theodore Levitt's 1960 article called Marketing Myopia, right? Where you where you don't think about the industry which you are in, but you think about the larger market that you can serve and the, and, and all of that. And I think that's where the larger role of patient centricity is, is important in my opinion. Great. Uh, this question popped up on personal selling and the future, uh, the future of personal selling in the changing environment and how, uh, how you know, online selling will will pick up in the coming times any take uh, dr amit we i think we, we somebody commented earlier about uh, you know about a hybrid model but any any more insights on that 
sir you are on mute uh... i'm sorry so uh, it would definitely be complementary or supplementary to the physical effort i don't think so it would go away i'm sure about that and if it does then it could be complementary in areas where you can deliver a better perspective or better value through digital media if you can understand the clear differentiation between what works for you in a physical way and what would work better for you in a digital way then i think that would be the best thing to do so if your cmes or all other things which are there which are content specific which are uh, you know very pinpointed to the doctor those could be all digital and the areas which are all you know where a meeting is required a reminder is required sensitization to new products the benefits of the product all those are required there you will need a physical thing and you also have to understand what the doctor wants that's more important what kind of information the doctor wants physically what kind of information the doctor wants virtually so you have to create a kind of interest group so if a doctor is academy minded maybe you have journals which you can send him you can interested chapters you can send him connect to him at that level rather than getting him into cmes or something else so there are so many ways to look at you have to first identify what the doctor wants and maybe then get into those things where you could have a cohort of you know like minded segments that's what Correct. would emerge and that's what you have to then target so some of them could be physical some of them could be digital and it would work great if i can if i can add one sentence dinesh i think the future of personal selling is going to be mass personalization right this is about how i can personalize uh, marketing efforts at a at scale and that's what digital platforms basically help you to do right it's very difficult for us to do all of this manage content manage channels manage capabilities manage context manage customer likes dislikes all of this humanly is very difficult to do that's why you have automation systems you have lots of different uh, technology tools you know and if if our strategy is to be relevant to every single customer that we meet and expand that right so i'm i'm not going to be talking only to 4 lakh doctors maybe i can talk to all 12 lakh doctors and and maybe i can go beyond doctors to families to 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 hospitals administrators you know different customer groups and all of that and then how can i personalize that if i'm having like 1.2 million or 12 million people or 120 million people or something like that how can i personalize down to n is equal to 1 so personalizing it at a mass level at scale i think is the beauty of digital selling and if you don't get that right i mean it, it it's a higher level of maturity and that's where i think some of these uh, big tech companies have really uh, sealed the deal because they are able to do this almost flawlessly at such a huge scale you know they can serve like 60% of humanity with uh, with absolute bang on precision so i think that's that's where the personal selling future will will lie yeah, absolutely i think that's a great perspective salil uh, uh, there are questions still popping up from the viewers but i think in the interest of time probably i can ask them to put them on uh, you know we on on youtube in the comment and probably we'll try and answer them uh, post the session i i don't coordinating with the speakers maybe before uh, you know we end let me just uh, quickly uh, i don't ask quick perspectives from you on 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 on, on your advice to the industry folks uh, largely in terms of uh, digital transformation and adopting this whole, whole genre uh, that's that's emerging and evolving Maybe a, a quick take on that. Uh, you know, probably with different perspectives. Uh, Abhishek here, he can probably uh, you know give a take perspective uh, uh, from the industry side. Uh, Mr. Dara, I would like to go first on this. A quick advice uh, to the industry. Sir, you are on mute. Uh, sorry, uh, you have to unmute yourself. I think yeah. the entire discussion has taken place on this, so uh, there won't be any. Uh, last minute but yes uh, people should understand that digitization uh, is important but you'll have to have a proper mix of digitization and your usual form of business but you can't escape this and gradually if you work together with all your stakeholders digitization is certainly going to help you in increasing your business and become more competitive globally absolutely that's right thank you Dr. Amit, yeah, can I come in? So, yes, uh, 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 adding to what Dara said, digitalization is going to proliferate every part of activity which oh. you have. You know, ten years back, you couldn't imagine you could order food on uh, your mobile phone or 
pay money. Now that's going to catch up everywhere. So it's come to medicines already. E pharmacies are close to one billion dollars. That's the, the sale today. So it's going to be huge. And India is a fragmented market. So it's all going to come together. They're going to be connected, interfaced digitally. And everybody has to be prepared for it. So it's not that we can advise the industry. We have to learn from each other and learn from each other's mistakes right. and appreciate each other's success. That's how it has to be the way forward. Absolutely. Salil? So, Dinesh, I have a little bit of a contrarian view here, right? And my advice to the industry would be, or my suggestion, I, I don't think I can advise, but my suggestion to the industry would be don't do digital for the sake of doing digital. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a very important thing that everyone needs to understand. I think people need to understand when you say digital strategy, it is the strategy that is more important than digital. You decide on digital much later. What's your brand strategy? What's your business strategy? What are you trying to appeal? What, which car, which class of customer are you appealing to? If you do not have any need to scale your operations, if you do not have any need to become a very customer centric organization or to think about the customer and serve the customer and create services, if we are happy with what we are doing and if we think that, you know, that's, that's enough, right? Most, most businesses, you know, I've been advising a few companies on digital strategy and what I see is there is no change in the strategy at all. And then they struggle to understand where to fit digital in. I don't think that's the right approach. I think you should do if you if you understand that your strategy requires you to serve at scale. You need you can you have the opportunity today of going beyond four lakh doctors to forty lakh doctors. And I've said this three or four times, but I believe in the power of repetition. Right? It has to kind of get in, inside the brain. So if you are if you are not thinking about scaling, if you are not thinking about going to extra customer groups, if you're not looking at geographical penetration, if you're not looking at getting into uh, in, into areas that you could not in an offline world, then don't do digital. If your business strategy is to simply do more of the same, then continue to do more of the same until you realize that that is not working. And then you become convinced that digital is the future. So don't okay. become, don't, don't believe that or don't come under pressure to do digital because Mr. Patel says so, or Mr. Amit, Dr. Amit says so, or I say so, or Abhishek says so, or you say so, Dinesh. I don't think that's the right message to go at all. I think it is important for them to realize, marketers to realize what their strategy is, what their objective is, and then think whether digital is required or not. Absolutely. I think, I think, you know, some of the facts that we've talked about digital marketing versus you know, redefining that line into marketing in the digital world. I think the world has changed. And how do you adapt your marketing strategies to the digital world? That's the way you have to have a mindset shift here. Abhishek, uh, you, you have something, like a, something like a disruption, I would say. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. So, Abhishek, your quick uh, uh, suggestion, quick take on... Um, no, I think I think our eminent panelists have uh, you know covered so much. I don't think that there's anything left to cover, and I totally agree with Saliji. Uh, you know, uh, I think we need to basically look at digital as a tool or a method to achieve a goal, right? So the goal has to be decided, the strategy has to be decided, and of course you should know what digital can do for that strategy, so that you decide that you know what, what part where you want to fit in digital if you really want to achieve that as a goal. Right. Don't just, uh, you know, retrofit it or just force it, force it into the system. I totally agree. And because that those uh, those initiatives never succeeds. And at the end of the day, digital earns a bad name that it doesn't work. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think a lot of tactical moves like that really, you know, uh, uh, do bounce back and, you know, they give a bad name like the right list. Right? So I think a thought through strategy is really required to do that. Uh, on this note, let me um, thank all of you uh, panelists for being here. We overshot our time, but I can see questions still popping up. And uh, I would again also thank all the viewers to be here uh, for being here patiently. Uh, I know a few questions are still unanswered, but I'll ensure that you know those are replied on the chat on uh, on, on YouTube there. Uh, thank you once again, panelists, uh, for being uh, part of this. I'm, I'm sure we've uh, it's a huge subject. We've just uh, scratched the surface, but I'm sure we've we've uh, given the viewers uh, a lot of thoughts to uh, carry home from here. Uh, uh, we have a short video to play, and then we'll we'll end this session. And thank you once again. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you. All right. An integrated global pharmaceutical giant was struggling to accelerate access to medicines. They wanted to bring customers deeper into their ecosystem, hence they were looking for a customer portal that can give complete visibility to customer interactions, 
securely access information about generic APIs, track sales requests and exchange communication. IND helps the pharmaceutical develop a portal with a unique microcosm of task management and customer collaboration. The portal's functionality was integrated with tools like data analytics to meet unique requirements and achieve customization. Salesforce to integrate chosen client data with the company's CRM. Outlook for secure communication between departmental heads, business managers and clients. Calendar to manage appointments, deadlines, etc. The portal helped the pharma giant successfully maintain the confidentiality of its patented products, documents and generic APIs. Today, the pharma giant is making good health attainable to the remotest areas by making expensive medicine obtainable, addressing unmet patient needs, providing better consultation, helping partners enhance their operational efficiency. With enhanced customer satisfaction, the pharma giant is touching millions of lives worldwide. Digitally empowering purpose driven by promises.